Uh, hello and welcome to our latest instalment of the Fit Finance Sessions Advisor podcast. Thanks very much for joining us. Henry Edison returned from yet another holiday here alongside Tim and, and Tom. Hello, boys. Hello. Um, to get things going today, we've actually had a, a question posed on our LinkedIn feed. So thanks very much indeed for your question, Ben. Um, Ben's question was, what's the smallest amount of money uh, you need to start investing? Um, great question. And of course, often we talk about great sums of money, but, but great oak trees are all grown from small acorns. And that's where we need to start at, at the outset. Um, first things first, you must have some money set aside for emergencies. But after that, really regular saving from probably 50 pounds a month is, is the smallest that we often see often see sometimes see or if you've got a lump sum of 500 pounds tucked away behind the mattress then um, then then that would work too um, so i hope that helps ben and, and do give us a call if, if you'd like any help or assistance in where to invest that first 50 pound investment you're going to make um <laughs> anyway to kick things off i think we were, we were Tom's got some interesting stories about what's been happening in the stock market over the last week, which has been uh, fairly tumultuous for some companies. Tom? Yeah, I think, um, I think you're starting to see banks having to provision for bad loans. So uh, I think HSBC yesterday, um, share price has fallen quite, quite a bit and has been doing so since both the start of the crisis and beforehand, I think financials or, or banks have been in love for, for quite some time. Um, and that, that's just getting worse because of the provisions for these loans through, through coronavirus. So I think essentially pretty much all the profit they've made um, has been sort of a portion to, to, uh, uh, to paying for these sort of bad, bad debts and loans that might come following the crisis. I think, um, I think the good news out of all of that, that might sound um, like there's not a lot of good news for HSBC investors, um, is that actually the banks are a lot better capitalised than they were back in 2008. And the fact they are putting aside funds for this means that structurally the financial system is a lot more secure. Um, and therefore, this, this crisis is very different to the previous one. The previous one was very much focused around liquidity people can get lending and, and so and so and whilst that's obviously put under pressure at these times um the fact the banks are far better capitalized than they were before and that they're provisioning for these loans means that the financial system itself is is less of a risk i think it's more it's more the wider economy that that's risk and um i guess following on from that it's um it sort of changes in, in terms of the way the world's working. I think uh, one of the big stories at the moment is TikTok and Microsoft. Um, uh, Microsoft were blocked yesterday um, from buying TikTok, although apparently Trump in his infinite wisdom has said it's fine as long as they get a slice of the, uh, the deal. So um, some very strange economic policy from from. Uh, from the White House, but uh, what else would you expect? Um, <laughs> idiot. Um, probably can't say that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, it, I don't know. It's it's an interesting concept in some ways. Um, actually, you, you think back to the last election in the UK and Corbyn and um, the Labour government wanting to nationalise things. Maybe, maybe maybe companies would be better serving of their. Um, their end users if there was some public ownership part of it um not necessarily going full public ownership but maybe maybe you will see more of these sort of sort of deals going forward i think it's more just talk from from the trump administration and this tit for tat with china rather than a, a new economic policy but um yeah it, it, it makes it interesting and sort of coming back to hsbc i think they're kind of in the middle of this whole us china um uh, debacle as well where I think they've come out in favour of some of the, the Chinese reforms so it'll be interesting to see what what happens to companies whether you're on sort of a, a US pro supply chain or a, or a Chinese pro supply chain but hence uh, just being diversified allows you to kind of ride out some of some of these storms. It's interesting what you say actually so I remember back back in 2008 um, when I was primarily a mortgage advisor back in those days 
And actually, with the whole the credit crunch, you're absolutely right. There was no liquidity around at all, and and securing a mortgage at that point was was very hard, and and remained hard for for the best part of a year. Nowadays, and, and this crisis that we're going through today, absolutely completely the opposite. In fact, the banks seem to be, you know, bank rates. I was talking to someone yesterday who had a fixed rate of one percent, um, and banks seem very very happy. Certainly now we're we're past the initial stages of it to to lend money to all and sundry um which is interesting um, yeah i think i think there was some some banks pulled out initially right at the very beginning because of they were worried about value so i think you could still get loans but down to 60 percent. but um yeah it seems the mortgage market seems very buoyant at the moment lots of lots of people moving house um particularly because of the new stamp duty rules and um, all the short-term stamp duty rules um, but equally, I think coming back to sort of a stock market perspective, it does make it hard for those banks to make money, and that's why why they're sort of suffering in terms of um, uh, share price. But equally, um, makes them a quite a good value play at, at, at the same time. They are well capitalised. They do pay healthy dividends. Um, HSBC, I think, has paid paid a dividend for most of the time, other than this this recent one due to some political pressure. But um, yeah, healthy yields on those. Yeah, no, quite. So maintain your nice diversified portfolio and you'll still get a few divvies from some of the banks at some point. Hopefully. 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 <laughs> Tim, tell us what's been happening in the currency world. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been quite interesting, actually. Well, very interesting last um, month or so, particularly I was focused on to the, the British pound and, and the dollar, um, US dollar, that is. Um, but so far this year, to give you a little bit of background for the dollar this year, obviously on what, sort of end of March when all this kicked off, there was a mad rush for safe haven currencies, as they say. So normally the yen, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, and, and um, the greenback, the, the US dollar. So that's been quite on a nice trajectory upwards. And actually the last month was the last, worst month uh, on record for a decade, for the last decade. And conversely, the pound uh, seemed to be the next source of uh, attraction for people selling dollars and jumping into sterling. So... Uh, that's had its best best month since uh, for a decade. So interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Um, I mean, really. I mean, the, the, the dominant seller for uh, for the dollars is is mainly people's uh, digestion, if you like, of um, the Fed's reaction and and Trump's reaction to the rising the ever rising um, CB19 uh, numbers over there. Um, and conversely, over here, you know, clearly, um, Bojo has put the, the halt on any further easing of restrictions, hasn't he? Um, and obviously, we've only got a couple of months left now until uh, until that Brexit deadline um, in December. So, I mean, I was reading this morning, uh, sort of Merrill Lynch's analysts are thinking Sterling's probably going to slide the last couple of quarters. So, for this last um, quarter, last couple of months into into December. But we'll have to see, you know, as always, as all these fundamentals play out. Um, but just some interesting, interesting big swings, big swings going on. Um, it's really tricky on sterling now because sterling seems to have been beaten up for about the last three or four years. And ever since Brexit was first announced, surely it's getting quite cheap now to buy sterling. No, that's right. That's right. And not too long ago, it was down at the massive psychological level of 1.2 against the dollar. Um, but as I say, it, it's been rising pretty, pretty swiftly. It's been quite a nice um, rally off it uh, for, for the last good couple of weeks. But I think it's, it's kind of coming to a little bit of a uh, ceiling. So I think from this point forward, it, you know, you're going to need some sort of fundamental news to come through, you know, sort of breakthrough news to, to push it in any other particular direction. This sort of week reached its um, maximum range, if you like. You can just go from purely from the technicals. But, um, but yeah, interesting stuff. I mean, more sort of on a side note, I, I don't know who else keeps up to, to, uh, to, to date with um, currencies, but I've seen, I've seen, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Henry Orton, but um, a load of the banks have actually been writing about their um, potentials of open-mindedness towards the digital currency. Uh, just, well, you know, they're, they're still maintaining their, 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 their own currency, i.e. the US dollar and so on, but it being in digital format rather than um, physical physical. Um, element, yeah. which probably doesn't come as much surprise to most people as obviously if anyone's seen the charts, cash, 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 and credit card uses uh, over the last couple of years is you know sort of a, a completely reverse uh, correlation with one another. But just interesting how 
maybe we shift even further into the digital world as, as time goes on. We'll see. Well, that's right. And moving on from that, I mean, Bitcoin is Bitcoin has just got seen another rise, and I think it's back up to eleven and a half thousand dollars a coin now, alongside mm-hmm. gold. The Bitcoin and gold seem to seem to have created some sort of a correlation now as the the emergency the emergency assets to go to in times of stress and, and panic. Mm. Have you noticed that? Yeah, no, I have. I have. I mean, I'm, as to why gold actually maintains its its uh, position as that, I'm not really too certain. I think it's more of a psychological thing, uh, if I'm honest, rather than it being some, you know, a fundamentally used asset, which in times of panic, in times of economic downturn, is, is a useful thing to hold um, for any other reason other than it being a psychologically sort of reinforced concept. Um, Bitcoin, I've no, no idea. I don't really follow Bitcoin, um, but maybe it's, it's off the back of this talk of banks being uh, open to this idea of a digital currency, obviously not not constructed in the same way that Bitcoin is, i.e. being decentralized and so on, but nevertheless, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's progress, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, because of course, both Bitcoin and gold, I mean, they, they never produce an income for you as, a, as part of your diversified portfolio. They just sit wow. there and they go up and down in value. But, the, but I suspect part of part of their their allure at the moment is as a, is as an inflation hedge and gold tends you know, if inflation goes up gold tends to go up and people um, get a bit more money for their, their their gold jewelry or what have you and so I guess it's 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 part of that play that whilst interest rates are very low people can borrow very cheaply and therefore the expectation is over the, the next few years there'll be some form of an inflationary there'd be some form of inflationary pressure throughout many economies around the world and mm-hmm. holding a little bit of gold as a, as a backstop sensible. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of with you on Bitcoin. I find it hard to believe that an electronic currency made up by some Japanese dude um, eight years ago should be worth me shelling out $12,000 for. But hey, what do I know? I barely know how to turn Zoom on. So, um, <laughs> so there we go. Had I invested eight years ago, I'd be sitting happy on a on a small fortune. But there we go. I think you could make that assumption about a lot of a lot of assets over the last few years. I think people are using Bitcoin as a as a defence against traditional assets, and the same with gold. Previously, you always you always would have not gone into gold because there's no yield. At least with a bond, um, you've got you've got some kind of yield, some kind of income. Um, but with yields being so low, that that sort of uh, uh, it, there's less of a, um, a a risk in 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 sitting in some gold. But it's still a very volatile asset class, much much like Bitcoin. And I think it's um, you can probably get more diversification through through mining stocks and and other things where they're still benefiting from that that price, but maybe a bit more diversified and a bit more robust and. and uh, equally, they're still very volatile. So, um, it, whilst there's no direct gold in, in some of the portfolios, then um, you still get access through some mining companies um, in the FTSE and, and elsewhere. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's certainly certainly interesting times. I think a lot of asset classes are going up, regardless. I think there's a uh, if people are expecting inflation, they'll just put assets in, into everything. Um, so there is a potentially a bit of a melt up where all assets uh, all assets go and you've seen over the last few months all assets kind of rising it's just seeing where we get to over the next uh, 18 months or so yeah well certainly if, if history is anything to go by then the equity market should be should be primed now for another for another 10 year bull run um, until covid 20 comes along <laughs> i think when um, <laughs> i think when you look at uh, Particularly when you look at, we were talking about sterling, but if you look at um, the FTSE and sort of relative price to, to other markets, it's, it's, it's relatively quite cheap. Um, not as cheap as it ever has been, but it's, it's certainly undervalued compared to a lot of other markets. And I think, um, I don't know, you look back at 2013, that was a very good year for, for UK equities. Um, could be could be quite similar. It's just, I think, some of those headwinds around Brexit and and uncertainty with the currency probably um, probably affects that. Yeah, no, I tend to agree. I think next year will be, um, I, I can see some very positive news and positive swings in the FTSE. I, I suspect that through the rest of this year, with with COVID still hanging around with no vaccine and um, 
I don't, I, there is uncertainty around Brexit, but I'm, I think I'm becoming more certain as time goes by that Brexit will just happen and there probably won't be much of a deal, that then the deal will then get thrashed out over the course of the next few years, um, mm. as and when people get around to, to worrying about it. It's yeah. amazing though, isn't it, how, how Brexit once upon a time, obviously it was the talk of the, you know, your taxi drivers were talking to you about Brexit and all that sort of, uh, that sort of, you know, level of, of conversation was going on. But now it's just almost as, oh yeah, of course, yeah, that, that B word is still hanging around, isn't it? Just yeah. crazy how perspective has just completely been thrown off this year. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like COVID. There's always there's always some major issue going on. I think that's it's explained to clients, particularly when they're, oh, should I should I invest money now because of so and so? Is it'll be uh, there'll be a run on grapefruits next week or, or whatever it is. Um, there's there's always something. Um, on that note, actually, <laughs> I thought there was. Um, I think it was the Philippines are having a. a, a everyone's panicking over there because they're having such an influx of mangoes. They don't want to do with it. So you're joking about it, Tom, but actually there is an issue out there for mangoes alone. Well, <laughs> mango the original, it, sorry, the original financial crash was tulips, I think, in Amsterdam. Everyone, um, <laughs> everyone bidding on the price of the tulips. So um, yeah, it, that's what I mean. There's always something around the corner. You, you've got to hold real assets, um, and yeah, it, everything moves in different cycles. What's cheap now will be better in the future and, and vice versa. I think you, you have seen a lot of US investors start to rotate out of the US into European equities as well. Um, so yeah, uh, some positive signs out there, but um, it, it always looked gloomy from whichever set of sunglasses you've got on. Mm. Not for you, Tom, surely not. <laughs> Only after well, I, a late think night. Probably, <laughs> I think that's probably enough from us today. Thanks very much for listening. Um, next week, I'm still off holiday. I'm going to be exhausted by that stage, having to work for two weeks in a row. Um, no doubt the other two boys will be back too. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And as, as ever, if you've got any questions um, and you've managed to listen the whole way through our podcast, please do ask some questions and we'll do our best to answer them next week. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>